This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 107, for broadcast on the 4th of September 2024. Coming up on Space Time, new discoveries about the universe's first galaxies, NASA's Europa Clipper mission moving towards flight readiness for next month's launch, and SpaceX places Falcon 9 launches on hold following a spectacular landing failure. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has shown that the universe's first galaxies weren't overly massive after all, but it appears their central black holes were making them seem bigger and brighter. The findings, reported in the Astronomical Journal, shows that galaxies which appeared overly massive in the very early universe most likely hosted black holes which were rapidly consuming gas, making them both brighter in appearance and also look bigger than they really were as a result. You see, when astronomers got their first glimpses of galaxies in the early universe from NASA's Webb Space Telescope, they were expecting to find lots of galactic dwarfs. But instead, what they found appeared to be a bevy of giants. Some galaxies appear to have grown so massive so quickly that simulations simply couldn't account for it. And that suggested that something must be wrong with science's understanding of the standard model of cosmology. That's the theory that explains what the universe was made of and how it evolved since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. The study's lead author, Catherine Chorowski from the University of Texas at Austin, says some of these early galaxies are in fact much less massive than they first appeared. But their central supermassive black holes, feeding voraciously, make them appear to be much brighter and bigger than they really are. She says while astronomers are still seeing more galaxies than predicted, none of them are so massive that they break the universe, or at least science's understanding of it. The evidence was provided by Webb's Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey. It was led by study co-author Stephen Finkelstein, also from UT Austin. It shows that friction in the fast-moving gas being consumed by these supermassive black holes emits a lot of heat and light, making the galaxies appear to be much brighter than they would be were the light emitted just from stars. So this extra light is what's making it appear that the galaxies contain more stars than they really do, and hence are more massive. When scientists remove these galaxies, dub little red dots based on their red colour and small size from their analysis, the remaining early galaxies are no longer too massive to fit within the predictions of the standard model. Although they've settled the main dilemma, a less thorny problem remains. You see, there are still roughly twice as many massive galaxies in the web data of the early universe as what was expected according to the standard model. Now, one possible explanation for this is that stars simply form more quickly in the early universe than what they do now. Chorowski proposes the early universe was simply better at turning gas into stars. Star formation happens when molecular gas and dust clouds cool enough for denser regions in those clouds to start to collapse under their own gravity. This eventually becomes a sort of runaway effect, ultimately turning the gas into stars. But as the gas contracts, it heats up, generating outward pressure. Now, in our region of the universe, this balance of the opposing forces tends to make the star formation process very slow. The Milky Way, for example, is only producing one solar mass star every Earth year at the moment. But perhaps because the early universe was closer together and hence denser, it would have been harder to blow gas out during star formation, allowing the process to go faster. Concurrently, astronomers have been analysing the spectra of little red dots discovered with Webb, finding evidence of fast-moving hydrogen gas, a signature of black hole accretion disks. And this supports the idea that at least some of the light coming from these compact red objects comes from gas swirling around black holes rather than stars, reinforcing our author's conclusions. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's Europa Clipper mission moving closer towards its October launch date. And SpaceX puts Falcon 9 launches on hold following a spectacular landing failure. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
NASA's Europa Clipper mission, the largest spacecraft NASA has ever built for interplanetary exploration, is now on track for a launch window opening on October 10. The next major milestone for Clipper is Key Decision Point E. That'll be on September the 9th, when the agency will decide whether the project's ready to proceed to launch and mission operations. The spacecraft's now been fitted with its enormous solar arrays at the agency's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Each of the two massive solar arrays measures 14.2 metres long and 4.1 metres wide. And just like the rest of the spacecraft, they too are the biggest NASA's ever developed for an interplanetary mission. And of course they have to be so large so they can soak up as much sunlight as possible during the spacecraft's mission to study Jupiter's ice moon Europa, which is five times further away from the Sun than the Earth. The arrays have now been folded up and secured against the spacecraft's main body for the launch. But when they're deployed in space, Europa Clipper will span more than 30.5 metres across. That's longer than a basketball court. The wings, as engineers call them, are so big that they could only be opened one at a time in the clean room of the Kennedy Space Center's payload hazardous servicing facility where teams are readying the spacecraft for launch. This report from NASA TV. It's going to take six years to get out there. Just think about the size, it's just blockers. The solar array is a powerhouse for the spacecraft on its journey from Earth to Europa. We've just completed our first flight-like deployment. These solar arrays are so big, we can only test one wing at a time. These solar arrays are really unique in that not only do they need to survive extremely cold temperatures, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it's also meant to survive the extremely harsh Jupiter radiation environment. We've built those solar arrays on Earth, we've tested them, but now they're actually going to Jupiter to provide power to all the instruments in the spacecraft to send back valuable science. It's an engineering feat that we're able to develop this. It is extremely exciting for me to be part of that. That's TJ Lee from Johns Hopkins University. Each solar array is composed of five panels needed to power the flybys in a region of the solar system that only receives 3 to 4% of the sunlight the Earth gets. Designed and built at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, and Airbus in Leiden in the Netherlands, these solar arrays are far more sensitive than the type of solar panels used on homes, and the highly efficient Europa Clipper spacecraft will make the most out of the power they generate. Once in Jovian orbit, Europa Clipper's solar arrays will together provide roughly 700 watts of power. That's about what a small microwave oven or a kitchen coffee maker uses. Aboard Clipper, batteries will store the power to run all the electronics, a full payload of science instruments, communications equipment, the onboard computer, and the entire propulsion system, which includes 24 engines. And while powering all that, the arrays also need to operate in extreme cold. The spacecraft's temperature will plunge to minus 240 degrees Celsius when operating through Jupiter's shadow. Now, to ensure the solar panels can operate in those extremes, engineers tested them in a specialised cryogenic chamber in Belgium. See, the spacecraft itself has heaters and an internal thermal loop, which keeps the onboard systems in a fairly normal temperature range. But the solar arrays are exposed to the vacuum of space without heaters. They're completely passive, so whatever the local environmental temperature is, that's the temperature they get. About 90 minutes after launch, the solar arrays will unfurl from their folded position over the course of about 40 minutes. About two weeks later, six 17.6 metre antennas affixed to the arrays will also deploy to their full size. These antennas belong to the radar instrument and they'll search for water within and beneath the Jovian moon's thick icy shell. Meanwhile, engineers have just completed tests on the radiation hardiness of the transistors being used on the Europa Clipper spacecraft. Longevity is key because the spacecraft will journey for more than five years in order to arrive at the Jovian system in 2030. As it orbits the gas giant, the probe will fly by Europa multiple times, using a suite of science instruments to find out whether the liquid water ocean beneath the Moon's frozen surface has the right sort of conditions to support life as we know it. Europa is slightly larger than the Earth's Moon, but it contains more water than all the Earth's oceans combined. Many scientists believe that life on Earth began in the oceans, possibly at mid-ocean ridges where unique habitats exist. Those same sort of conditions are thought to exist on the floors of Europa's oceans, which raises the question, could life have formed there as well? And that question is fascinating, because if we do eventually find life on, say, the red planet Mars, well, that would be exciting, but Earth and Mars have been swapping rocks for billions of years. 
So there's always a possibility that a meteorite strike on Mars from Earth may have contaminated the red planet with earthly microbes. On the other hand, it could have been Martian microbes which first provided the Earth with life, in which case we're all really Martians. But if life is found out beyond the snow line on the Jovian moon Europa, that's a completely different story. That's not a case of panspermia contamination from somewhere else. It would mean that life arose there independently. And if life has arisen in our solar system at two separate locations, it would mean life must be common throughout the universe. Europa Clipper's main science objectives are to determine the thickness of the Moon's icy shell and its interactions with the ocean below, to investigate its composition and to characterize its geology. The mission's detailed exploration of Europa will help scientists better understand the astrobiological potential for habitable worlds beyond Earth. The spacecraft was assembled at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. It was then transported across the country to the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida an operation which, as NASA TV explains, has its own logistical problems. Have you ever thought about how we take a spacecraft from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and move it to Florida to get launched? The engineers, the technicians, the quality assurance members of our team are actually getting our spacecraft ready. The process for preparing the spacecraft is really a art form, a dance. One of the things that we have to think about is how we're going to make our spacecraft fit inside of our shipping container. We have to figure out what hardware needs to ship with the main spacecraft and what hardware needs to be taken off, like taking off the high gain antenna. One of the things we need to do is lift the spacecraft from its ground support equipment and move it into the shipping container. Stop. Okay, our multi-mission container was specially designed to carry spacecraft across the country. That means that the temperature's controlled, the environment's controlled, how many particles that can be inside are controlled to make sure that our spacecraft stays clean and safe. The spacecraft has an amazing journey once we're in the shipping container. Got him. Woo! It goes from JPL on a big semi-truck. It ends up at March Air Reserve Base. Once it arrives at March, we unload it and rapidly move it into a C-17 for a flight that will take it to Kennedy Space Center. So the spacecraft isn't the only thing that we actually pack up and ship across the country. There's all these things that we call ground support equipment, GSE, that need to go with us. Those help us manage the spacecraft. We have 12 trucks of ground support equipment, and then we will have two trucks that support the spacecraft move itself. So a grand total of 14 trucks. Emotionally, this is one of the scariest periods of time. It's the first time the spacecraft is going from a very, very, very controlled environment and going into more of an uncontrolled environment where other human beings are around. Behind the scenes, is a lot of engineers that are planning out every step of this process. Lots of members of our assembly test and launch operations team actually uproot their families and move to Florida for six months. My emotions for Europa Clipper and the spacecraft leaving is bittersweet. I think it's gonna feel like if my kids go off to college, when the spacecraft was here in Southern California, I could come over and visit anytime I wanted to. Now in Florida, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. It's more like getting a phone call every other week, but it's gonna be exciting too, because now our spacecraft is getting ready to do its final dance. It's getting ready to graduate and be on its way to do this science around Europa, this beautiful moon around Jupiter. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Europa Clipper Chief Engineer Kobe Boykins and Europa Clipper Integration Engineer Ben Marty. This is Space Time. Still to come, SpaceX puts Falcon 9 launches on hold following a spectacular landing failure. And later in the science report, a new study shows that taking a break from screen time works wonders for kids' mental health. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
SpaceX placed a brief hole on Falcon 9 rocket launches last week after one of them caught fire, blew up and then fell over as it was attempting to land on a drone ship following what was a successful Starlink deployment mission to space. Right now, SpaceX is still the only company landing orbital-class rockets after use. And they've become so good at it, people forget just how revolutionary the feat really is. So when one of them fails to survive the landing, it raises eyebrows. The mission had successfully launched another 21 Starlink broadband satellites into orbit. It was a record-setting 23rd flight for the same first-stage booster, number 1062A, which had been flying since November 2020. Following main engine cutoff and stage separation, the booster performed its normal boost back burn and began its journey back to the surface. Everything seemed to be going nominally, with the landing burn starting on time and the landing legs deploying just as planned. But as the rocket touched down on the drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas, it appeared to have landed at a slightly higher velocity than normal, causing the landing struts to splay out more than usual, resulting in the engine bills appearing to hit the deck. Now that's what it looks like in the video, and if that's what actually happened, it could have damaged the motors, releasing propellant, and that would have explained the balls of flames separate from the rocket engine burn, which was seen licking up one side of the booster and spilling across the landing pad. Now, as the hard landing occurs, one of the landing struts also buckles, causing that landing leg to collapse. Consequently, the booster then tipped over into the cloud of flames. At least that's the way it looks. An investigation into the failure is now underway and will give you the results when they come out. But this incident could delay the next scheduled launch of a Falcon 9, which would be on the Polaris Dawn mission. That's a manned orbital mission organised by billionaire entrepreneur Jared Isaacman, which will undertake the historic first ever spacewalks by an all-civilian crew. The Polaris Dawn launch has already been postponed twice, the first time due to a technical issue with a helium leak and then due to bad weather conditions at the planned landing site downrange of Cape Canaveral. And it's worth pointing out that's the same landing site which the Starlink booster used. So, are we dealing with a case of the swell being too strong, making the landing more violent than it should have been? I guess time will tell. This is Space Time. Time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has shown that simply wearing a face mask in public places could cut down your risk of common respiratory symptoms by at least 3.2%. A report in the British Medical Journal surveyed over 4,500 adults in Norway about their lifestyles, their use of face masks and their risk of infection and then asked half of the participants to wear a face mask when they were out in public enclosed areas, such as shopping centres and public transport, while the other half were asked to remain mask-free. While the mask participants reported lower rates of respiratory symptoms, such as runny nose, sore throat, coughing and sneezing, 80 participants also reported feeling a bit silly about being the only ones wearing a mask in public, while 40 reported feeling uncomfortable because of breathing difficulties, foggy glasses and poor mask fit, which may have also led them to avoid public places anyway. Despite the discomforts, the authors say the results indicate that wearing a face mask in public could be a simple low-cost way to reduce your risk of catching a respiratory infection. A new study warns that scientists may be missing millions of undescribed extinction-prone insect species. A report in the journal Insect Conservation and Diversity claims new research suggests that undescribed insect species were significantly smaller, less abundant and less widespread than those already known about, making them harder to find and more extinction prone. Scientists in Borneo who are collecting rove beetles in an area of tropical rainforest found that of the 252 different species of beetle they found, 76% were new to science, not having previously been named. And it's not just other places. In the wet tropical north of Australia, scientists found that among 107 species of bark beetles identified, 58 were also new to science. A new study has confirmed earlier research that making kids take a break from screen time works wonders for their mental health. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, reanalyzed results of previous Danish studies, which looked at the effects of reducing screen time on kids and teens. 
they found that a break from screens reduced problematic behaviour and boosted good behaviour. The trials included 89 families with a total of 181 children and adolescents. Screen time was reduced in 45 families while the others continued as normal. In the families that curbed screen use, the biggest improvements were seen in young people's emotional issues, problems interacting with their peers and in being more caring and sociable towards other people. However, the trial really only looked at the benefits of reduced screen time in the short term, and the authors say future studies should investigate whether these improvements can be sustained with longer-term reductions in screen use. Facebook and Instagram boss Mark Zuckerberg has confirmed that the Joe Biden-Kamala Harris White House demand that his company censor COVID-19 content and cover up the Hunter Biden laptop story, falsely claiming that they were misinformation. Zuckerberg consequently ordered legitimate debate removed, accounts shut down, and fair and balanced coverage either shadowed or silenced. In a letter dated August 26, 2024, Zuckerberg told the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee that he now regretted not speaking up earlier, as well as other decisions he made as the owner of Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp around removing content detrimental to the Democrats and the Biden-Harris administration. Of course, it's not the first time Zuckerberg made the admission. He said pretty much the same thing a few months earlier on Joe Rogan's podcast, confirming that he ordered Facebook to restrict the story about Joe Biden's son Hunter Biden's laptop during the 2020 presidential election. Identical allegations about the Biden-Harris White House were made last year in the Twitter files released to the media by Elon Musk. Commentators say it's more evidence that social media companies have become corrupt tools of government, using their power to spread lies to manipulate the public for political gain. Many American voters say they would have changed their vote in the 2020 presidential election had they known the laptop story was real. Here to discuss Zuckerberg's stunning admission and what it means for social media is technology editor Alex saharov Reut from TechAdvice.life. People have suspected for a long time that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, that, uh, you know, he just hasn't been truthful. I mean, the proof is that he's been on a 20-plus year apology tour for all the things he's done, for playing fast and loose with people's information. I mean, he even, in one of his original leaked SMS-style messages with a friend of his when it was called The Facebook, but long before it was Facebook itself. I mean, he said, look, to one of his friends, if you ever need any information on, on, you know, his basically his friends and colleagues at the university was at, he said, I've got it all, the pictures and photos and emails and phone numbers. This they is trust back in me. the days when they were rating females, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, and, he, and that's he said, how Facebook started, or the Facebook. Yeah, now, nothing has changged in all this time, and he has built a giant, should like, well, charged. there should be a trial. There should He should be judged before 12 of his peers. I mean, if anybody else had done this, if Elon Musk had done this, I mean, they'd be outraged. And and it's time to stop giving people a free pass just because they happen to be billionaires or the head of a, of a major social media platform. Well, they're doing that in France now, aren't they? I've seen it uh, said on X that Pavel you know, was arrested for not giving up information. And, he's and Mark the, he's Zuckerberg... He's of Telegram. Yeah, and Telegram is accused by various governments and of other people for not having backdoors. And I saw him talking to Tucker, talking about how the FBI wanted him basically to put in backdoors and they tried to bribe or get his lead engineer to become a double agent so they could figure out which open source libraries were being used in the formation of Telegram so that the, the US government and effectively any criminal could then get a backdoor into the entire system. It started before then because people were noticing that they were being cancelled on Twitter as it was before Elon Musk bought it. They were being cancelled on Facebook. I mean, they were being suppressed. But finally, we're seeing some movement at the station in holding some of these people accountable. What's Zuckerberg's motive? to come out now. I mean, it's almost the October surprise, but uh, it's a month early. I would imagine he's trying to avoid, uh, you know, going to jail, being arrested. That's Alex saharov Royt from TechAdvice.life. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. 
Space Times also broadcasts through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeart Radio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Times store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 